Hello everyone, this is Mary Gregory. Uh, welcome back to our uh, class today. Uh, CCS, we're doing a CCS coding clinic on coding respiratory conditions. Now it's important for you to understand that you're going to get some of these uh, respiratory conditions when you take the CCS. Now I can't guarantee you what type of questions you're going to have on CCS. But generally, you're going to have something about pneumonia. You may have something about asthma. You may have something about COPD. And so it's very important that you understand how to code those. Not only for the CCS, but if you are an inpatient coder, striving to be an inpatient coder, then, of course, you want to make sure that you understand how to code these things accurately. This is part two of coding for respiratory diseases. Uh, for preparing you for the CCS. In our last um, YouTube, we talked about uh, the difference between a complex pneumonia and what we call a simple pneumonia. And I talked to you all about there's two different sets of uh, MSDRG. Uh, MSDRG 193, 192, and 191 is for what they consider to be simple pneumonia. That is based on the organism that the patient have or may not have. Say for instance, influenza. If you have a patient that come in with the flu and they have pneumonia, you have a combination code that you must use. Uh, if they are also having a bacterial pneumonia in addition to that, the coding clinic do allow you to code that bacterial pneumonia in addition to the influenza pneumonia. Now, I said I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about this MSDRGs. So when you're dealing with pneumonia, simple pneumonia, uh, J18.9 is one of them. It, uh, a lot of times we see the physician refer to that as community acquired pneumonia. That goes into one of those three tiers MSDRGs. Now this is very important because some of you all may take the CCS and you do not work with inpatients. Remember this in dealing with MSDRGs if they give you one on that test. If it is a three tier MSDRG like pneumonia then the highest number will weigh the most and you'll get paid the most. So if my patient have a pneumonia, just plain community acquired pneumonia, J189, and then they have an acute systolic uh, heart failure, has to be acute, then I can go into 193. So for simple pneumonia, 193 is the highest. 192 is the next highest. So when you have a patient with 193, you're saying that's a very sick patient with community uh, acquired pneumonia. If you have a 192, then you just have what we call a CC. Now, you do not have to miss this test question. Your book now, your ICD-10-CM book, will identify for you the codes that are MCCs, CCs, and no CCs. If you don't see a MCC or a CC beside your code, that means it's not a CC. And it, or it's not a major. So you're going to go into the lowest pan MSDRG. So 193 is the highest, 192 is next, and 191 is the lowest. When you have what we call a complicated complex MSDRG, I mean pneumonia, you're going to go into an MSDRG of 177, that's the highest, 178 is the next highest, and 179 is saying, hey, my patient got a bacterial pneumonia, a staph pneumonia, but they're not really that sick. When you got a 177, you're saying you got a very sick patient and you deserve more money. You got a 178, you're saying, ah, they mill away, they sick, but they're not real, 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 real sick, then um, you're going to get uh, less money. And 179, you're saying, oh, okay, this patient have no complication comorbidities. 
Now, once again, remember, CMS have already decided what is a what is a major complication, what is a complication, and what is a comorbidity. We realize when we are doing inpatient coding, we have some very sick people sometimes, and guess what? They don't have a major CC. They don't have a CC, and we we won't get a lot of money for that patient. They just don't meet the mode as what to what CMS have determined is a major CC. And and dealing with your MSDRGs, you have some um what we call a two tier, and and two tiers can be two different ways. One of the two tiers say, look, you only gonna get more money if you have a major CC or CC. So if you have a CC, I, I believe that may be one like meningitis. Meningitis uh, is one of those um, MSDRGs that's like that. And they said, look, if you got a CC, you're going to get $8,000. And if you got a major CC, you're going to get $8,000. If you have no CC, you're going to get four grand. You're going to get $4,000. So you, uh, you'll get used to the MSDRGs as you work with them. But let's talk a little bit more about this aspiration and bacterial pneumonia. One of the things that they ta te taught me when I was learning the code, not sure they're teaching us now, is that you have to know what an aspiration patient looked like. How can you know that this pneumonia may be an aspiration pneumonia? What does that patient look like? Well, if your patient have a gastrostomy tube. Now, I'm not saying they have aspiration. But as a coder, if I have a patient that come in and they have a gastrostomy tube and they have a pneumonia, I am going to be looking in that chart to see if in the, uh, in the progress note somebody document that he's aspirated. Now, once you see documentation that the patient is aspirated, you as the coder cannot make the relationship. You cannot. What you have to do is query the physician and ask the physician is there if there is a relationship between this aspiration and the pneumonia. See, you have to do that. You may, another patient that may uh, make you think that it's an aspiration to uh, pneumonia may be a nursing home patient. For whatever reason, sometimes people in nursing home aspirates. Is the patient an alcoholic? See, alcoholics sometimes are prone to aspiration. Uh, what else we had? A uh, couple different people you can uh, look at. Does the patient have difficulty swallowing? Dysphagia. Have the patient had a CVA and now they have uh, dysphagia? Are they having difficulty swallowing? Did the patient get choked? See, as my grandmama would say sometimes, did they swallow it wrong? Did it go down the wrong pipe? See, this is what a good coder is looking for. And when you take the CCS, this is some of the documentation you may see. And once again, if your coding scenario says to you, this patient is aspirating and they have pneumonia, but you never see where that physician in that scenario says, Number one, this patient has an aspiration pneumonia. Or they can say it a different way. Aspiration causing pneumonia. Or they can say uh, pneumonia due to aspiration. Say. Aspiration with pneumonia. So uh, that physician has to make that relationship for you. If they do not, do not select aspiration pneumonia as your answer because your paper will be marked wrong. So I just want to uh, share that with you. Another type of pneumonia that you see is what we call ventilator pneumonia. It has its own special code and it goes to a little bit different MSDRG. Um, so when your patient come, come in um, with pneumonia, and this is, this is interesting, I want to make sure I cover this with you. If your patient come in with pneumonia and they put the patient on the ventilator, and the patient get asked, uh, patient get ventilator associated pneumonia. You actually gonna have two types of pneumonia on that patient. You're gonna have the pneumonia that the patient came in with, and you're gonna have a POA or yes. Then when the patient come off the vent and they got a pneumonia due to the ventilator, then guess what? 
you're going to code the ventilator associated pneumonia and your POA present on the mission will be no. See? There are times when patients have been on a ventilator and they go home, they, they appear normal, they appear well, and they go home and they come back with a pneumonia, your physician may document a ventilator associated pneumonia. So ventilator associated pneumonia can be a principal diagnosis, but it's most of the time it's a secondary diagnosis, but it can be principal. If the patient is transferred from hospital A to hospital B because of the ventilator associated pneumonia, maybe you're working or coding for a very small facility and the patient had to go on a vent and now they, um, the patient is ill and they feel like it's not, um, they don't have the capability of taking care of that patient and they may send the patient to hospital B because the patient has uh, hospital associated pneumonia at hospital B. It can be that principal diagnosis with a POA, I guess. And so we want to look at that. Always make sure too, when you're coding a ventilator associated pneumonia, you got to remember you got a very specific code. I believe it's J95851. Okay. Now, you can only code that when the physician documents it. Then the next thing you have to realize is this. Sometimes when they have a ventilator associated pneumonia, the physician will say it's a staph. They may say it's a pseudomonas. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot then change and code that pneumonia as a staphylococcal pneumonia if he says staph or as a pseudomonas pneumonia if he says pseudomonas. You cannot do that. So if the patient have a ventilator associated pneumonia and they are growing staph, you will have two codes. You're going to have your ventilator associated pneumonia code and I, in my PowerPoint I got an example. So your uh, diagnosis, this could be a principal, J95851 and B9561. See the B as in boy, B9561 have to be a secondary diagnosis as well. But rarely should your B95 uh, should be a principal. Rare, if ever. If you code net out as a principal, uh, the coding police may come visit you. I always tell people there's no such thing as coding police. They seem to think that. But you know, the OIG or, you know, an auditor, you can get caught up in an audit and make your quality scores look bad if you're doing that type of thing. So remember, if your patient have a ventilator associated pneumonia, that is a J95581. If they are growing a staph, I'm just using that as an example, they could do a strep, they can grow pseudomonas, they can grow other stuff. Then I'm also going to have a B9561, okay? I cannot code that out as a staph pneumonia when the physician have documented as a uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. So I did want to talk to you about that. Remember, also, you have to know what is integral, especially when you take the CCS. They want to know if you know what's integral to these pneumonias. Most of these pneumonia always have the same symptom. The patient is going to have a fever, they can have a cough, they can have a high WBC, they can suffer with chest pain. You would not pick those up as secondary diagnoses when the physician has clearly indicated that um, the patient has pneumonia and all of that is related to that pneumonia. Now what's not related to pneumonia is pleurifusion. See, not everybody has pleurifusion. And pleurifusion with a pneumonia can make a patient a lot sicker. And so there are times when that patient may have a pneumonia, may have a pleurifusion. Um, this is one respiratory failure. Respiratory failure is not integral to pneumonia. There's a lot of people who have pneumonia and never have respiratory failure. So you have to understand and know that the uh, respiratory failure is not integral and it will require a secondary code uh, to be uh, looked at. Now, one that's really tricky though is atelectasis. That's spelled A-T-E-L-E-C-T-A-S-I-S, -E -E I believe. Atelectasis. That one's a little bit tricky um, in that the coding guidelines 
not your official coding guidelines, but if you're looking at the coding clinic or you use um, ICD-10 CM PCS book that we use here um, to train with, Alexis can be a part of it. But sometimes Alexis can become so bad that it will require additional treatment. And so when I want to code that as my secondary, I'm looking to see was there some additional treatment. A lot of times the alexis may clear up once you clear up the pneumonia. But if the physician continue to document it, that uh, and they're doing some different things, you know, they're giving more respiratory therapy, that type of stuff, they're changing the antibiotics because of it. Um, so you want to be looking for that kind of documentation in order to code that. Uh, sometimes, um, i tell you another thing that's not integral to uh, pneumonia, and that's encephalopathy. Uh, encephalopathy, though, is one of those diagnoses that tend to get us in trouble uh, because basically nobody have a great definition for what it is. If you looked up encephalopathy, it just said brain disease. Okay, there may be some people walking around with brain disease, okay? I might be one of them, just kidding. Um, but... It's a hard one, but when your physician documented encephalopathy, it can be coded separately. So I just wanted you all to know that. Also, uh, remember when you take the test, please understand and know about COPD uh, exacerbation. COPD with an acute bronchitis requires two codes. Uh, COPD with an acute exacerbation of asthma requires two codes. Let me, uh, this is a little tip. Now, I'm not sure if they're going to put this in the test just yet. The coding clinic came out and said, if you have, you know, at I 10, we got some very specific codes for intermediate, moderate, persistent, and I think moderate, persistent asthma. Then you have a code that just said asthma unspecified. Well, the coding clinic have come out and said, if your patient come in with COPD, with an exacerbation or just COPD and they have asthma and that asthma is not identified as being exacerbated, is not identified as being persistent, is not identified as being intermediate or moderate persistent, you do not code it. Now I don't necessarily agree with that, but if I'm taking the test, I'm gonna give it the, I'm gonna do it the way they want me to do it. But I don't necessarily agree with that. So if you got a COPD patient that come in and they have asthma, and that asthma is not identified as one of those very specific asthma, and they and it is not exacerbated, don't code it. That's just a, a little tip. I'm not sure if they're going to get that on the test. Uh, this was a recent change, I think maybe in fourth quarter of 2017. And so you probably won't see it if you're taking the test between now and April the 30th. 2018 but beginning May 1st you may see that if you take the test afterwards okay well it's been so great being with you all today thank you for showing up for this uh, video today just remember if you have any questions please feel free uh, to email me or send put the question out there on YouTube you guys that are really techy know how to do all that once again Danny helps me a lot because he is so techy um, and he was he was some pretty cool hairstyles too. Uh, just kind of throwing that out there. You know, you got to have fun with this. Um, so remember now, you got to follow me on Facebook. This is your year to follow me. Uh, I want you to hook up with me on LinkedIn. This is your year to do that. We're going to tweet each other. And I want you to continue to watch these videos. Because I'm about changing your life. When you get into coding and you begin to uh, experience how people think about you when you have your certification, oh, they just think so highly of you when you become certified. And then as, as y'all young people like to say, the moolah began to come in, it's a life-changing thing. Someday I have to give y'all my testimony. Um, so make sure you follow us and don't forget to visit the website www.masconingsolutions.com. I look forward to talking to you next month where we're going to have another great class.